This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. I, I love it when people come here to this new place that we've created, but they walk in and they say, oh, it just feels right. It feels like it's been here. It feels old. It feels like it's landed in the right place. And I, I love how comfortable people feel at this, at this place. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. There are many that have created restaurants or cafes that have become the hub of the community. Others have forged connections with local growers, farmers and makers to celebrate the best of the region and support small artisan businesses. And there are some that have embraced both to change the perceptions of food production for a large part of the population of a big city and deliver delicious, nutritious food too. Angela Hurst is a founder and owner of The Wandering Cooks in Brisbane, Queensland. Angela, how are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm good. You started with initially with a gathering of food trucks sort of strung together um, with extension leads everywhere and built this amazing thing called The Wandering Cooks. Where, where did the idea come from? Um, the idea for Wandering Cooks started when um, I, you know, was trying to get my own food business ideas off the ground, and it. I started to realize as I was doing that that um, I couldn't understand how anyone could afford it, and also who how anyone could take the kind of risks that you have to take to be able to invest, even if you could afford it, afford it to start these food businesses. So I really didn't know what I was doing. And so I started a business for people that don't know what they're doing. Um, so we, we um, it, well, there's various, there's, there's, there's various details to that. But basically, um, I thought, you know, if I could create a series of kitchens that people could rent to try out their food business ideas, that they um, wouldn't, they'd be able to be more creative, they'd be able to be more responsive to the possibilities of, you know, you know, thinking outside the box with their food business without having to, like, you know, put their house on the line to do it. And one of the things that was the was the foundational to that for me is that if I could get small producers, people with, um, with big ideas, but, but, you know, just starting off to start to think about where they source their food from when they're, when they're right at the beginning of their business, that maybe we could actually be quite impactful as far as, um, the way that food businesses link to the places that produce their food and the farmers that produce their food. So, it's, um, you know, it was a, it was a crazy idea. It was a, it was a pretty big idea in Australia. No one else was doing it in Australia. It, it was, it had its, um, you know, there was, there, there was a, a history of it happening in the states. You know, there quite a few for about, you know, five years previous. There were there were quite a few people that had been setting up um, commissary kitchens for food trucks and, and, um, and kitchens for small artisan businesses, but nothing, nothing in Australia. And, um, I, you know, I did it because I was a, I was, I was a passionate, um, food maker. Um, and I, I kind of, I let, I let my, my making, my cooking, my, my production of food, um, I put that to the side so that I could support other people to, to do it. And, and that was, you know, that was partly about where I was at in my life. You know, I was, I had a, had a, had a, had a two-year-old um, and I couldn't, I couldn't see how I could 
I could, you know, work the kind of shifts that hospitality requires of you. So, yeah, supporting small food makers seemed like a good idea. What was it like in those early days? Uh, do you have any stories of, of the challenges at that time? Well, it was, um, I mean, there was, it was, it was, I was pretty clear. I, I was pretty clear about where I wanted this, this business to be. I wanted it to be um, really centrally located and, um, and it needed to have a series of facilities around it. So it needed, you know, people needed to be able to drive up to it. They need to be able to park. Trucks needed to be able to load. It, it was, it, it required a bit of space. And in those days, um, so that was nine years ago now, um, Brisbane was uh, right on the, the edge of a, quite a boom in um, medium density housing. So everywhere that we looked was had a new zoning. So there were the, all these beautiful old warehouses that would have been perfect for cooks to land in. But, you know, we, we, there was no way that they would give us the kind of lease that we needed to be able to invest, invest in the site. You know, they, they'd say, you know, you can have, you can have three years, you know, in the second option, having a demolition clause on it and things like that. So it, it was a year of looking at warehouses pretty much faced with that. And also it was just after the floods, the Brisbane floods. So there was a lot of um, warehouses that were actually under the flood line as well. Um, Then we finally found this place on Fish Lane and uh, the landlord really didn't, it was, it was an inherited property. Um, He really didn't want to see it um, go, you know, uh, disappear. And he, he just gave us a lease situation that was, uh, it was like being, you know, hands at a unicorn you know we had what seemed like at the time a lot of a lot of time we had a had five years with another fi- an option for another five a demolition clause wouldn't hit in until the second lease and we'd have two years notice you know before we'd have to leave so it it seemed reasonable enough to to invest in building these kitchens and then I had to scrape together the money and that was a challenge and went into a lot of debt. And, um, but I, you know, I'd done a lot of research and I'd done a lot of work in spreadsheets and I'd pulled together, you know, a lot of interest in the place. You know, I'd, I'd put up these gum tree ads and, and say, hey, anyone got a business idea but no kitchen? Who'd, who'd, who'd want to join us? You know, and oh my God, I had like, I don't know, after the, the first, <laughs> the first, uh, output outreach from me I I think I had like 160 different um, people that wanted it but then I opened the doors and guess what (laughs) no one like maybe like two or two or three people um, ended up kind of coming into the kitchens it's a big that was that was the that was the biggest first learning curve was that just because people say they're going to do something doesn't mean they're actually going to put their money behind it so, um, yeah, from the beginning, I was spinning my wheels. So that brings us back to food trucks. So spinning my wheels, trying, desperately trying to actually fill these kitchens, realizing that, you know, although people were supposed to be using commercial kitchens, the regulations weren't really tight enough to actually require them to. So, you know, they might, you know, book into the kitchens, but really not use them very much and I just I just started to realize that we we had to we had to look we had to diversify we had to look towards other um revenue streams and that's when we became that was the beginning of us becoming an event space as well as 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 a set of kitchens so what were some of the food businesses to flourish in in that sort of first uh part of the business sort of unfolding one of the first um businesses to call me were this um these two sisters and um they were they were just you know wanting to do baked things selling at markets that was you know a lot of people were 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 headed in that direction i want to bake something i'm going to sell at the markets uh but they really did have uh, they had a twist on on their on their on their stuff that that you didn't see around like at that time you know a real 
it's a little bit trashy American, but, you know, in that, you know, tasty, trashy American kind of um, milk bar thing going on with their stuff. And and also they they were immediately really receptive to um, sourcing their ingredients through some more um, careful channels. So, you know, getting good eggs and getting good butter and, and all of that, they were just up for. They were called the Alphabet Cafe. So they had this, um, you know, hope in their, <laughs> in their business name that they would, you know, eventually become a cafe. And they, they just did anything, any crazy idea that we had going. So, you know, they were baking, um, they, was, they started wholesaling and they were selling at the markets. And then when we started inviting the food trucks to park, so this was before food trucks tried to take off in Brisbane there was nowhere for them to park um privately on 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 private land um and they were only allowed to sell on private land so at that stage there was no ability for a truck to park on a public on a public street so we opened our car park up to um to food trucks and we set up a a, a, we set up um bin fires in the middle of the car park and pulled out tables and the alphabet girls would um toast their homemade marshmallows on the fire and make s'mores in the middle of the car park. <laughs> they were awesome. So they were there um, from the very beginning they were there and like maybe three years before we had to move, um, they managed to open their own cafe and they've got a really beautiful cafe in, in West End and, yeah, they're, they're killing it, killing it. Yeah. When was the, the moment that you realised the potential had sort of um, eventuated with, with the wandering cooks and, and there was real momentum behind what you were doing? Um, it, so probably the momentum came when I gave up trying to make money on the kitchens. <laughs> so, so I thought that they would be the main revenue generator and uh, it just didn't work that way. Like people could not afford the prices that they were worth, basically, like with the equipment that was in them uh, and the, the, the capital we'd put into them. They just, they couldn't, af- they couldn't afford the hourly rates that you'd see other places set up for, you know, professional, um, uh, you know, for, for, people that professional for companies that are launching um products and they're doing research and those kinds of kitchens you know they they charge thousands of dollars a day you know for for using commercial kitchens well clearly we were having trouble getting people to pay 25 dollars an hour so um i i got to a point where i i actually i sat with (laughs) I, i i spilled i i put it all out uh, and I, I, I gathered together the, the customers that I had and said to them, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce the, the prices of the kitchens down to something that makes it really easy for you to really work on your business, but you've got to promise me. Well, not just promising. I'm going to change. I'm going to change the way I book them so that the the the, the hours that you the minimum hours are longer, and and um, and if this doesn't work and and you guys don't commit to like periods of time, like you know you've got to commit to your business, you've got to commit to it for six months. If you can't commit to those time periods, then I'm gonna I'm gonna have to close these kitchens. I'm gonna go out of business. So I sort of stabilized that. And then um, just focused on events. So we became the place that would say yes to any kind of community um, uh, focused event. So a lot of the, the 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 people that had interesting ideas for for um, exhibitions or um, festivals or uh, uh, fundraising events, um, uh, panel discussions on on various issues, any of those kinds of um, people. We wouldn't charge them again. We wouldn't charge them, but we would make money on the bar. We'd make money on the booze, and um, we'd focus. We focused on revenue through our bar. So, I mean, I I, I made a lot of potentially unconventional uh, decisions along the way about the things that I wasn't going to make money on, uh, in order to focus on the things that I thought we could make money on, which ended up being the bar. Uh, 
and I still look at it and think, could I have done it? Is there was would there have been an easier way? Could I have done it differently? But at the time, yeah, I mean, you just can't force people to do things they don't want to do, right? And <laughs> they don't, you know, they don't if they don't want to cook their cookies in in uh, in a kitchen if they want to do it illegally at home if they want to run their catering business from their home and then they 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 just will until they get caught right anyway so that yeah so it yeah um the pivotal moment was getting into events turning into a bar and then um and then there was a switch that happened from um uh, really allowing uh, product manufacturers any time they were liked in the kitchen, you know, across the schedule, to focusing on getting uh, a series of people that wanted to actually make food for our venue to to set up during uh, food service hours. So we moved from um, product makers having having their 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 freedom and at that point when when the kitchens were really cheap and food product makers um, prevailed we had about 130 different small businesses registered in the kitchens which yeah so some of them you know were only using the kitchens for a couple of hours to jar some chili jam you know a month that kind of thing but we had 130 and that that really put us up in like one of the most populated uh kitchens uh, shared kitchen facilities in the world and it was a logistics nightmare but it was very active (laughs) you know it was very lively and that made a nice backdrop for events as well but again didn't make enough money so we started to um carve out parts of the day you know the the dinner shifts the dinner times and we cut holes in our kitchen kitchen so that they had frontages to our event space and we started to to hand pick um food makers that actually wanted to start restaurants rather than products and um and they started to provide uh, a hawker style uh uh food service for us at that point i know a lot has changed since then as well which we'll get into but you mentioned that you you gave away your cooking for this idea take us back to when you were young what what sort of role did food play for you when you were young um i think food's always been um an obsession in my family so my 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 dad and my mum were both um really really keen on on eating out and would take us to beautiful restaurants from a very young age and I always just I was just an eater I just absolutely loved to to eat anything and they were also cookbook fiends so I I would take cookbook and and food book fiends I would take cookbooks to bed you know and and read them as a as a kid I think um Harold McGee's uh on uh the science and law of of food and cooking is it that was one of like my first <laughs> bedtime books <laughs> i'd take it to bed and read about eggs and um and all the ways that they they work in cooking and um marco pierre white's uh, um white heat was one of the the first books that i devoured so cookbooks um was something that i i i coveted from my parents and then you know would read them like novels and and I'd I'd go to any cooking class that would come to 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 Brisbane. You know, Christine Manfield was one of the first chefs that I saw, and I just thought she was amazing. She was so amazing. I still I still love her her book from that time, Spice, um, with its like 150 ingredients for one one dish style. So um, yeah, so I was obsessed. And then I stayed kind of obsessed with, with, uh, with, with it in a restaurant sense through, through high school. I never really considered it um, beyond something that I enjoyed at that stage. But once I left home and, and started cooking for myself, I focused on like just loving, loving food from a, from a, <laughs> from a cookbook angle and from going, going to gorgeous restaurants. And from there, um, you know, I, I I went to uni and I and I was I was I was kind of following a path that I felt like I had to follow. Um, you know, I had to do 
uh, you know, what, what people that do well at school do is go to uni and find a career. But really my, my passion was, was still in food. And, and I, I, it was this thing always tapping my shoulder saying, how do, how do we, how do we find a way in? And how do we find this food? How do we get this food into this, this life that you're creating? So, um, I, I finished, a. uh, finished an honours um, degree at, at uni and I immediately went and approached Leanne Newmans from the Green Papaya for, um, for work and I, I started an apprenticeship with her and, um, and she was my first, uh, she was my first strong female teacher in food and I, and I, that that wasn't my mum, <laughs> um, and I just kept seeking them out. It was the the women in food that really that I was attracted to working for, and and I think it was you know what they were like as as leaders and and bosses, but also you know just wondering how it is that they run kitchens and how they make it all work. So she was my first, and then I and then I went back to uni, and and I I just I just vacillated in and out of. Um, and working in kitchens and then, and then, um, and then coming back and, and thinking about food in a, in a scholarly way. So I, I just, I basically did that through my, my twenties, um, gaining a little bit of experience here and there, but also just filling myself up on, on, on cooking projects and, um, and, and reading projects and, um, developing a insane cookbook library which is like an index to my brain. When did the real connection uh, that is a real driving force for you to sort of ethical uh, producers and farmers become a really important in the overall picture for you? I think it was something that I started to become um, cognizant of when I was studying architecture and uh, and I, I remember going to a sustainability conference in at the Gold Coast and hearing Robin Francis uh, speak about this thing called permaculture, and she was so inspiring. And I had never heard of anything like this thing. And it sounded like architecture, but like it's you know it's arch nemesis. It was it was messy and uh, evolving, and it was this just this beautiful beautiful design concept and I I remember at the end of her talking about permaculture I went I went up to her and said I I just want to do what you do how do I how do I do what you do because <laughs> the because architecture wasn't really making sense to me um and she said well you just come and do a permaculture certificate with me so I I went and 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 did that and immersed myself in the 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 beautiful messiness that is uh edible landscape design and from there it just it just started to it started to materialize this this sense that um you know everywhere i looked in cities i'd see ornamentation and and an aesthetics built out of uselessness and i i just didn't get it and i wondered where where all the food was you know, where is all the food? And the more I looked into it, the more I realized that, you know, our food, our food production systems were broken and they were so broken that we'd hide them, you know, from, from, so no one could see them and uh, keep them, keep them far away from any kind of entanglement with people's uh, sense of what's right, you know, what's right in their lives. And I just wanted to think more about that and, and, and have an impact on, on that thinking. So I, I focused on looking at permaculture first and, and, and seeing whether, you know, the way that it, it, it thinks about design could have a, could have a positive impact on, on architecture and the way it's taught at universities. So that was my first research project. And then after that, and after some, you know, cooking in, in restaurants, I came back and, and started a PhD, which initially, you know, I just kept, kept in architecture and, 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 thought it would be a continuation of that, like thinking about food production in cities and how it works and, and just realized that I, you know, that, that my mind did not work like architectural theorists and that I needed to find, I needed to find my kin. And so I spent a year like just moving around the university and I went to sociology and urban anthropology and, 
and all sorts of different departments and trying to find someone who could could make sense to my brain and I eventually found this wonderful philosopher called Michelle Bullis Walker <clears throat> he's actually coming to dinner here <laughs> on Thursday night tomorrow Thursday night yeah um and she yeah she just introduced me to continental philosophy and a particular um ethicist and and his writing and just said to me you know I just think this I think he might make sense to you so why don't you just read him for six months Imagine someone telling you that. Just read this person for six months. Just read them for six months. See how you go. See what you think. So I did. <laughs> and I I just loved, I loved what he was. Uh, I just, yeah, it just blew my mind. It blew my mind. And I I I just realized that I wanted to think, I wanted to think at that level, you know, at, the, at this philosophical level about food. Yeah. So did that. Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> The Wandering Cooks uh, is not the same as it used to be, and it's also moved. Tell us about the move and, and what it's transitioned into. Uh, so the move, the move was imminent because we received our um, we received before COVID hit. Um, not long before COVID hit, we'd received our notice to leave. So um, someone had bought the site we were on and we, um, we had two years to, to, to vacate, basically. So we knew we needed to go. And at the same time, uh, we'd reached a level of confidence in what we were doing and the way that people were embracing our, our space that we were able to make quite a a blunt and not very popular decision with a lot of our food makers to um, become more hard-lined about their sourcing. So it was one of these things that we'd, we'd, we'd attempted to do so many times over the years to, to get people to, to, only, um, to only purchase their ingredients from, from what we would, you know, what I can shorthand say from ethical sources, but it was never, it was never easy. And we never had the right kind of conditions to be able to, 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 to make that work. And, you know, we were, we were scared that we just wouldn't have anyone serving any food if we were too hardcore about it. So we, we never celebrated that part of the business um, specifically, because I just didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be a greenwashing business. I didn't want to pretend that we were achieving something when half of our businesses or three quarters of our businesses weren't, right? So we got to a point just before COVID hit that we said, okay, enough's enough. We got to do it. You know, we've got a list of these incredible farmers that we want to work with. Um, and uh, from in, you know, six months time, if, if you guys haven't come on board with working with these farmers, then if you haven't agreed to that and, and, and we'll work through the issues with it, we'll work through the problems. But if you haven't, haven't, if you don't agree to that being the problem of this place, then you got to find, you got to get head out on your own. You got to find your new, your new accommodations. <laughs> so, uh, it was, it was, you know, some people were like, yeah, sure, whatever, like, of course. And then a lot of people were really, really angry at us. So we were, we were dealing with that at the time and we, We'd, we'd started what we called the ingredient challenge, which was this um, attempt to bring in people that were already wanting to source the way we were interested in sourcing. And, and, and um, we had uh, a series of chefs that were helping us workshop with them and, and help them um, work through the problems of sourcing from, from small ethical farmers. You know, how do you deal with, with the, the vagaries of their, you know, with their supply and how do you keep your menu um, flexible enough and how do you cost it appropriately and all of that stuff. So we just done that. We just had gone through our first um, crew of, of, of intake from that and then COVID hit. And so we really hadn't been able to set up the new system and we just said goodbye to a, a whole heap of food makers that we, that had decided not to, 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 to do the challenge with us so we were we were we were fucked basically at that point <laughs> and um so i my head exploded imploded really and i i disappeared uh i disappeared in myself for quite a few months um we just closed because we there was just no model that would work 
um, we just couldn't operate. So we just closed and um, slowly I started to imagine the possibilities out of that. And the first steps out of it were were not where we are now. They were still other people cooking in the kitchens and um, – it, sorry, other people, but the but what we did decide is that we would just take it on. We would take on the kitchen ourselves. It was a huge relief because I knew then I didn't have to force anyone to do the kind of sourcing that 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 I wanted us to do. That I could just make that that choice myself and 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 do it. So that was great. Um, and so we we started up slowly and surely. That was the the first year of COVID. We we at the end of the year we started opening one night a week, and we started this beautiful um, market on a Saturday morning uh, that showcased all of the the farmers that we wanted to work with that we were working with. So we had this beautiful um, produce market that was like a farm gate. So it was us buying the produce in and and selling it like a like a pop up sort of grocery store on a Saturday morning. Um, and it was, it was all kind of, you know, it was, it was, it was still a little crazy, but it was starting to show legs. And then, um, and then my, the chef that I'd employed to do it left and I was just thrown back in the kitchen. Like there was absolutely, there was just no choice. Like I had no chef and I, I just had to step back in and, um, it's funny that I had never I just I just had lost my confidence to to, to actually do that. I just I just I did, I hadn't even considered it really that it could be me, you know. Um and then it had to be me and I stepped back into the kitchen and I went I just I, it's like from the moment that I did it, I just knew I didn't want to do anything else. I was like, "Holy shit, how have I been away from this for so long?" Really, how long, how, how have I been away from this for so long? This is like this, I just felt like a different person. I felt completely myself again for the first time in 12, 15 years. Tell us about how you feel when you cook and, and a bit about your cooking. Uh, I, I feel, I, I feel completely. I can I feel completely in the flow when I'm in the kitchen, uh, particularly when I I don't have too much pressure to get out of the kitchen or I've got a bit, bit of space. You know, one of those days where you might <laughs> – it's crazy, but if you're overworking, you know, you're not just there for service but you're, you know, coming in on your days off. Those are actually the days where I feel truly – myself I, I i go into the kitchen and i'm i'm faced with a mountain of of produce to deal with because we still run the farm gate on a saturday i still get in a whole lot of produce i take um i try to take different things from different farmers so that everyone like has has some stuff coming in and then you never really know what's going to sell at the farm gate sometimes you know all the broad beans go and sometimes you know half of them go um and so I'm, I'm faced by a mountain of produce on a day like this. And I just, I kind of just start somewhere. I just like dig in. I just pull out, you know, something. And, and the, the thing that I pull out, as long as I've got a, a, like quiet around me, then I start to imagine where it could head and the, the, the lines and the connections um, web together in my, in my mind. And I, and I, and I can, I can, I can start to taste what what it wants to be. It's the same thing that used to happen to me. Um, I worked at the Rose Bakery in Paris for a while, and it was my job to um, make the daily special. And it's the same thing. I would get this thing that would happen where I'd I'd start with whatever ingredient you know we'd brought in. Say it was uh, you know an, an organic chicken, and I knew that we also had za'atar in you know fresh za'atar. Or something like that, and then I would start to. Um, I I could actually imagine myself on a on a uh, on a Mediterranean mountain edge, a cliff, and I've never even you know I haven't been to a place like that, but I could I could taste the air, I could feel the breeze, I could 
and I and I'd start to see where the dish wanted to go. I could tell if it wanted to be quick or slow or or, or contrasty or 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 sharp. I don't know. Does everyone do that? That's just I don't. That's just where my. That's just I don't know. The same thing happens when I'm when I'm reading reading cookbooks. Is I can get on the same kind of train. Like it it starts somewhere and then I and then I start to see a menu appear. So that's all to say that my menus are very eclectic. They tend to they tend to switch around and change with my mood and with what we've got available. So sometimes they seem really quite uh, Southeast Asian focused. You know, there's a lot of heat in it. And sometimes we get a bit of, you know, feedback. It's like, oh, all your dishes are hot. It's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that is. You know, I don't know why at the moment that's the case. <laughs> and then, you know, and then something changes. And, you know, we're getting a lot of leeks in and we're getting um, – uh, uh, broad beans and asparagus and and it just it's 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 the menu feels it, it feels much more smooth and 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 uh it's yeah it's got a very different tempo than it did like uh, a little while ago so um it globe trots it's 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 not it it changes um it often changes like from lunch to dinner because we're just constantly moving through stuff and sometimes what we're moving through is is quite short in in supply so it's just around for a little bit and then and then shifts on and i was thinking about about this that you know that's not actually that different i'm sure to a lot of the way a lot of fine fine restaurants work you know that they they're 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 cooking in a similar way but i think the thing the challenge that that I've set for this place is that we we want to bring that kind of attention, but it's it's very middle of the market, you know. Like I I want it to be a place that people feel like they can come to for dinner all week long if they want, you know. It's not it's not just for special occasions or when you can afford it. It's like when you need nourishment. I want people to come here when they feel like they need to be nourished. Has this uh, dramatic change and this idea that you came up with many years ago that's changed so much, has it changed you in the last couple of years, this transformation? Yeah. I mean, it's, I think it's made me, <clears throat> it's made me uh, clearer about it. It's, it's just, I think it's just brought my, it's kind of brought my heart back into the picture for a long time with cooks. I was very heady and I was thinking about, business a lot and and w- talking to people about a business a lot and and I, analytical i suppose you know very you know very focused on problem solving you know how it was still creative in a way but it, a different kind of creativity and i get a lot of migraines like i'd i'd um i was uh, you know constantly uh getting to myself to this point where i'd have to you know, at least once or twice a month, just lay up in bed for a day or two, just nursing a brain that had stopped working. And when I stepped back into the kitchen, I was, you know, when I was really kind of pushed back in, I had a headache. And then I I just, you know, just started doing what had to happen, you know, started pulling things together and, and, and making things work. And I it just disappeared. And I really, I really, you know, I still get, I still get occasional tension headaches from like working too hard or having my neck down or, you know, all the things that happen in a kitchen, carrying too heavy a pot, but I don't get migraines. I don't get them anymore. They just stopped. So yeah, it's changed me (laughs) in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think I could ever, I don't think I could be out of, I don't think I could ever be out of the kitchen again. I can't. I can't imagine what that would, what life would be like out of the kitchen again. This um, natural attraction that you've had to the food industry, this inability to pull away from it, what, has really transformed not just you but the local community and those people in Brisbane as well. What is it that you're most proud of? I'm. I I love it when people come here to this new place that we've created. And it hasn't been here for that long, but they walk in and they say, oh, it just feels right. It feels like it's been here. It feels old. It feels like, 
you know, it, it, it feels like it's landed in the right place. And I, and I, I, I love how comfortable people feel at this, at this place. Uh, and that they have a natural tendency generally to, to claim it as their own. You know, I don't, <laughs> I feel that way about, um, about my staff and, and my customers that I, I like the idea of being kind of able to step into the, to, into the shadows and do my work <laughs> quietly and, 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 and uh, with uh, observation and, and with enough of a push um, at, at the people around me to, to just go on and do it the way they feel like they, they, that feels right. And that's, you know, how they, how they come here and use the space and also how, you know, how my, how my wonderful staff uh, take, take on their responsibilities and, and embrace the, the passions of this place. I feel really proud of that. Well, Angela, what you've created is absolutely extraordinary. And I know there's so much more we can talk about. So um, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today. Please keep in touch and we'll definitely have to catch up again soon. Oh, thanks very much for having me. It's been fun. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.